Sean was born as Jamal Barrow in Belize City, Belize. He's the son of Dean Barrow and Francis Maivet. His father was a former Deputy Prime Minister of Belize from 2008 to 2020, while his mother is the sister of Michael Maivet, which was one of Dean Barrow's longtime political colleagues in Belize. As a child, Sean's time was divided between his mother in Brooklyn, New York, and his lawyer-slash-politician father, who initially failed to acknowledge his son. His mother moved to the United States when he was only three years old, leaving her son with his father who was busy with politics, and left Sean between the care of of his mother's brother Michael and his father's sister Denise in Belize City. His father was in a relationship with another woman and even made remarks that his other kids were made out of love, while Shine was an accident. Even though his father was a famous and well-off lawyer in Belize, he and his mom didn't see any of his money. When Shine was 7 years old, his mother brought him to the United States and they settled in the Flatbush section of Brooklyn, New York. He would live with his mom and spend summers in Belize with his father. To support her young son, Frances worked as a housekeeper, taking as many jobs as she could to pay the rent and buy groceries. Shan was often left to his own devices and like many urban youths, found his way into trouble. He began developing a strong interest in the hip-hop culture of the 1980s and 1990s. As a kid, Shan had stood on chairs at the back of the crowd to catch outdoor shows in Brooklyn's Little Caribbean neighborhood. Earth, wind and fire, Chaka Khan, reggae, anything. He loved it. I remember just being enthralled by the performances. If I wanted to grow up to be anything, I wanted to be a performer in front of tens of thousands of people. At age 17, the gang scene lured him in and he joined a Brooklyn crew named the Septicons. The crew was notorious for slinging drugs and robbing students in the Flatbush area. His gang life didn't last that long because soon, while in a fight, he was shot on the shoulder by another kid, leaving him with a 6 inch scar. He recalls this incident as a bloody wake up call. I understood that you have to have humility, had to walk away and look at the bigger picture. I didn't really understood that before I got shot. I said to my mom, I promise, I'll stay alive for you. I won't get myself killed. I won't kill anyone. I'll turn my life around. In response, Francis moved the family to another part of Brooklyn and encouraged Shine to do better in school and stay off the streets. In Drink Champs' interview, he also mentioned that around this time he listened to a lot of Bob Marley. And so I started staying in the house and just listening to music. And Bob Marley used to calm me down. You know, when you listen to Bob Marley, and I used to say, man, you know, this is the type of impact I want to have on the world. He began writing poetry and even enrolled in the New York City College of Technology computer program. He paid off his tuition by working as a bike messenger, buying an 18-speed bicycle and riding it from Brooklyn to Manhattan, where he made deliveries around the borough. I wasn't gonna sell drugs, I wasn't gonna get involved in criminal activity, I knew I gotta work, and the quickest way to do that was to deliver messages. So I would ride my 18-speed from Brooklyn to Manhattan, ride around Manhattan all day. Taxis were almost running me over, girls at the front desk were looking at me like I was the worst thing in the world. And through that experience, music just started coming to me. While college was the safe option, he wanted to make a name for himself in the music industry. Not long after, he dropped out and started to pursue a career in music. Shang first started writing rhymes on the back of his messenger clipboard, but soon enough, he was writing everywhere, in class, in the bathroom, he just couldn't stop. He'd been a shy kid growing up, but staring down the barrel of a gun had changed him and turned him fearless. In 1997, Shine got hit with a conviction that he could get up on stage and mix it with hip-hop's best, a burst of super talent as he calls it. Shine's salty baritone bore a close resemblance to that of Christopher Notorious B.A.G. Wallace. Just months after assailants gunned down Wallace in LA, Shine protested his super talent at a barber shop on Church Avenue. The regulars loved it. Barbers don't lie, especially on Church Avenue. It's not like you're gonna come in there and they're gonna tell you what you want to hear. Don Poo, a record executive best known for discovering Foxy Brown, remembers hearing Shan for the first time, saying, the metaphors and the way he put together his rhymes, I was like, man, you're dope. In 1998, during one of his freestyles in the barber shop, he got discovered by hip-hop producer DJ Clark Kent, who at the time was working on the Notorious B.I.G.'s first posthumous album, Born Again. He really liked what he heard and quickly took Bow to Bad Boy Records, where Sean Puff Daddy Combs signed him to his label. The deal that Puff gave to Shine was more than impressive. It was reported that Shine received millions of dollars, three cars of his choice, and two homes just for signing. The contract also included a five studio album deal. His life was changed in a second. From sleeping on his mama's couch to flying to Beverly Hills in the first class to record with top rappers in hip hop, the deal was impressive, but it also made a lot of sense for Bad Boy Records.
You see, at the time when they signed Shine, Bad Boy was at a pretty weird spot. While just a couple of years prior, they were at the top of the game, Biggie's death left a huge void in the label, and Puff was looking everywhere to find a new star. Label reached its commercial peak with the success of Puff's solo album, selling over 7 million copies in the United States, Biggie's Life After Death, and Mesa's Harlem World. Regardless, it didn't stop the eventual decline that was about to happen, and over the course of the next couple of years, their sales started to go down. Puff Diddy, in an effort to replace Biggie, tried saving the label by putting Mace in Biggie's place, who did a phenomenal job but would later find a calling in faith, and at the height of his career, he stepped down and retired from music. Puff saw the talent that Shine had and believed that he could become the next big star. After signing a deal, they immediately started working together, and not long after, Shine began making appearances on recordings made by his label mates. He made a guest appearance on Mace's second studio album, Double Up, on the song from scratch. Put more niggas in pits than Brad, man. Can't dodge bullets, too bad, man. He also appeared alongside Total on their single, Sitting at Home. Let it be understood, bad boy run this. Brooklyn the AT, they pump this. And was even featured on Combs' second studio album, Forever, on a song called Reverse. I'm a god would be if he was a straight G, too night, too tight, arrogant, yeah, yeah, you're high. high. Moreover, the same year, his father became the Belize House of Representative Opposition Leader, taking charge of the weak conservative coalition known as the United Democratic Party. After so many struggles, 1998 became a pivotal year for Shine and his family. After a generous label deal and finally getting the spotlight that he deserved, the future for Shine was looking brighter than ever. But little did he know that in 1999, something drastic would happen and all of his dreams of success would be taken away in a split second. On December 27, 1999, Shine and his mentor label boss Sean Combs, with his then girlfriend, singer slash actress Jennifer Lopez, arrive at a Manhattan nightclub named Club New York on West 43rd Street in Times Square. The club was full with people and street guys from Brooklyn, which included Matthew Scar Allen and Nino, who both made a name for themselves in the streets. The story goes that Shine and Puff with their girlfriends were having a good time at the club, until at some point during the night, the crew decided to leave. While exiting the club, Puff was carrying a bottle of champagne and accidentally bumped into one of the club's patrons, knocking the drink out of his hand. The guy who Puff bumped into was none other than Scar. He responded with a shove and they started to go back and forth at each other. Shine knew Scar and Nino. Scar, Scar, who was the instigator, I know Scar from Brooklyn. Those, those, those are my guys. I didn't really have a problem with them. That wasn't my beef. That was, that was Puff's issue. They had a problem with Puff for whatever reason. I don't know what their problem was with Puff. God, Nino, and the entire Brooklyn crowd was in Club New York. I seen them, it was all love. But when they started arguing with Puff, I know what these Brooklyn guys are capable of. I know what Scar is capable of. I knew what Nino was capable of. I know what happens once these arguments stop. You know, when these arguments start, you know, it, it, it becomes it becomes a problem. Once Scar, once Scar starts saying, you know, I'm going to kill you, you know, you DOA, you know, once he starts talking crazy, yeah, I, I became afraid for my life. I know what happens, you know, once he says, you know, it's, it's about to happen, you know, it, it, it's about to happen. While all of this was going on, one of Alan's friends allegedly threw a stack of money into Puff's face and the situation instantly turned dark. According to Shine, he saw somebody reach for a gun and he immediately reached for his to defend himself and his friends. It didn't take long before the shots were fired. And I seen somebody reach for a gun and I reached for my weapon and I defended my friends and myself because once he starts firing, once whoever else pulls out a gun starts firing, it doesn't stop there. Both parties started shooting at each other. In the crossfire, Shine managed to hit one of Alan's friends in the shoulder. After he hit him, the security guard tried grabbing Shine from the back, and that's when his gun allegedly went off into the air, leaving a bullet hole in the club's ceiling. According to the reports, Diddy was also firing shots in the club, but more on that later. Unfortunately, during the chaos, two innocent bystanders were hit, which also includes a woman who was hit in the face, but ultimately managed to survive. Shine with a gun in his hand, tried running out of the club, but ultimately was captured by 
while the police officers waiting outside. Diddy and Lopez jumped to the Lincoln Navigator in an attempt to flee the scene. Puff, his bodyguard Anthony Wolf Jones, better known as Jeannie Deal, Jennifer Lopez, and his driver, Wardell Fenderson, were chased by the police officers for more than 20 blocks, but ultimately were stopped and arrested. During the pursuit, allegedly one gun was tossed out the window, and another one was later found under the driver's seat. The prosecution later alleged that Puff Daddy himself was trying to bribe his driver to take the charge for the gun during the police chase and even offer him $50,000. Eventually, all of them were detained and taken into custody. Involved or not, Puff Daddy is facing charges after he and Lopez were caught fleeing the nightclub shooting with a stolen gun in the car. Charges have been dropped against Lopez, but Combs, his bodyguard, and the driver are all charged. It hasn't been determined who had possession of the gun, but his lawyer says the car is registered to Puff Daddy's record company. 21-year-old Jamal Barrow, a lesser-known rapper and part of Combs' entourage at the dance club, was indicted by a grand jury on a slew of charges. One person was indicted for uh, attempted murder, who was in the club. Um, and was involved in the shooting. This was not a good press for anybody, and it got a lot of unfavorable attention from the media. The case immediately drew headlines, not because of the three people wounded on the shooting, but because of the celebrity of those arrested. While awaiting their trial, which only started in January 2001, on September 26, 2000, Bad Boy Records released Shine's debut album, called Shine. Although Shine himself got a lot of backlash because of the shooting, the album was a great success. It peaked at number 5 on the Billboard 200, sold just under 160,000 copies in its first week, and eventually achieved platinum status. It also spawned singles like Bad Boys, That's Gangsta, and Bonnie and Shine. While awaiting their trial, Shine reportedly said that Puff cut off all ties with him and they had no contact whatsoever. He even went as far as saying that Puff tried blocking the release of his debut album. The celebration of his album also didn't last long because right before the trial, Shan was arrested again for being involved in a car incident while driving without a license and seriously injuring two people. It seemed like Shan couldn't catch a break and with trial right around the corner, his dreams of becoming a superstar were growing dimmer by the minute. And I'm trying to make it clear to you, I want to say to, to you all face to face, I had nothing to do with a shooting that night in a nightclub. The trial started on January 17, 2001. The case would be later known as the Puff Daddy trial due to Combs' celebrity status. Puff Daddy and his bodyguard were charged with gun possession, assault, and bribery. Shine, on the other hand, faced attempted murder, assault, gun possession, and reckless endangerment charges. Puff hired himself two high-profile defense lawyers, Johnny Cochran, and Benjamin Braffman. Cochran's clients have included O.G. Simpson and Michael Jackson, while Braffman has represented such clients as Salvatore, Sammy the Bull Gravano. Shine unfortunately was left alone, and he had to hire his own attorney. Puff cut all ties with him, and his laws would later go as far as asking judge to trial them completely separately, which ultimately was denied. Two of three victims, the guy who was hit in the shoulder and the girl who was shot in the face, both made civil suits against Puff Daddy. This will become an important detail later. At trial, the prosecution proposed that Puff was responsible for the shooting because his celebrity status had allowed his party to enter the club New York without being searched for weapons. They also accused Combs of firing a gun into the club ceiling during the fight and the hole in it wasn't from Shine's gun but rather from his. The girl who was shot in the head, Natania Rubin, testified that she saw both Combs and Barrow both fire the gun. I'm not famous. I don't have a publicity machine. I don't have a billion dollars of insurance on my body or any part of my body for that matter. Does that make me any less valuable? Remember the civil lawsuits made against Puff Daddy I told you about? Well, Puff's lawyer Barfman responded to her testimony with an accusation that she was trying to malign Combs' reputation to aid her multi-million dollar damages lawsuit against him. The second witness was a chauffeur, Wardell Fenderson, the guy who was driving the Black Lincoln Navigator during the pursuit. He testified that he saw Combs slip a pistol into his waistband before entering Club New York. The driver also claimed that Combs and his bodyguard Jones fumbled with a hidden compartment in the vehicle, trying to hide the weapon as police chased him from the club, claiming that he saw either Jones or Combs throwing the weapon from the SUV. Fenderson also accused Combs of offering a diamond ring as a part of $50,000 payment for claiming ownership of the gun found in the vehicle. He recalled Puff saying, listen, 
you know I'm Puff Daddy, I can't take the gun. When it came to the prosecution witnesses, the trial started to become weirder and weirder by the minute. The prosecution called up three witnesses, two of them, both of whom had testified before a grand jury that they witnessed an argument between Combs and Allen, aka Scar, changed their stories on the stand. They denied being able to identify Combs as a participant in the scuffle or seeing him with a gun. A third witness admitted that she was unsure what she might have seen in Combs' hand as he ran from the club. It was more than strange for witnesses to switch up their stories that fast. And while this was great news for Puff, it put Shan into an even stickier situation because the witnesses that testified not seeing a gun in Puff's hand implicated that it wasn't Shine's. When it came to Puff's defense, they began their case by stating that Puff Daddy not only never fired a gun, but he didn't have one in the first place. Thank you for coming. On Sunday evening, I went to Club New York. And under no circumstances whatsoever that I have anything to do with a shooting. I do not own a gun, nor did I possess a gun that night. I had nothing to do with a shooting in this club. I want to make this 100% clear. I had nothing to do with a shooting in this club. And I feel terrible that people were hurt that night. They denied all the claims against him, even the money being thrown at his face, and were accusing people of looking to make a quick buck from a famous executive. The police complained that someone threw money at him. Oh yeah, you, you, you believe it? Okay. No one threw money at him, it's a lie. When, when is it gonna be fair for Sean Puffy Combs? When? He's out with Jennifer Lopez. If you were out with your friend and you got into a car and there was a gun in the front, you wouldn't be arrested. Several witnesses recalled Combs dancing on a coffee table at the club with his arms raised, but none of them saw a gun in his waistband. The most damaging witness to the prosecution was security guard Cherise Myers. She recalls Scar Allen throwing money in Puff's face and being jostled as club's customers grapple for cash. Myers was advising Combs to leave the club rather than argue with Allen when she saw barrel firing twice, even going as far as saying that he was the one who let off shots first that night, which went completely against Shine's defense. Afterwards, she proceeded to fall on top of Combs to protect him. An important detail to mention is that this witness was called by Puff's attorney and not the prosecution. Calling this witness tremendously helped Diddy, but it completely threw Shine under the bus. When Combs took the stand in his own defense, his attorney asked him if he had a gun at any time on the night of the incident, to which he replied, absolutely not. During the rest of the trial, the prosecution kept reminding the jury that they were shooting victims in the case and that Combs had actively tried to bribe witnesses to change their testimony, to which Combs' attorney responded with, bad people came into this courtroom and made bad accusations because they wanted to get rich. Shine, on the other hand, didn't have such high-level lawyers. Shine was accused of firing three shots that wounded three people. He admitted to shooting a gun and hitting a guy in the shoulder, but claimed that he only acted in self-defense. Shine stated that he had also fired into the air but did not believe that it was bullets from his gun that injured the other two bystanders. This is where it once again gets interesting, because an eyewitness and a ballistics expert also testified during the trial and claimed that the three injuries may have been caused not by Shine, but by a second gunman. The ballistics expert said that at least one injury may have been caused by 40 caliber weapon, and if according to witness, Puff was indeed standing where they claim he was, the hole in the club ceiling would have come from him and not from Shine. The interesting part is that when Shine ran outside of the club, he held a 9mm pistol, but 40 caliber shells were also later found on the floor. The other two guns which were taken by the police were also 9mm. Despite several witnesses who claimed that they seen Puff shooting and having the gun at the scene, including his driver and the girl who got shot in the face, unfortunately for Shine, the overwhelming majority of witnesses put a gun in his hand, and him admitting to firing at least once, even though claiming in self-defense, was more than enough for the jury. On March 16, 2001, the case was finally closed, and the verdicts were these. Combs and his bodyguard Jones were acquitted of all charges, which included illegal ownership of three 9mm guns and bribery. Shan was convicted at trial by a jury on two counts of assault and reckless endangerment and criminal possession of an illegal weapon. The only bright side was that he was acquitted of attempted murder. His sentencing was set to June 1st, 2001.
To say that the news was devastating for Shine, I think would be an understatement. Right after being found guilty, he was also hit with a $5 million lawsuit by Mark McKenzie, a guy who was injured during a car incident. The court would later shut down the lawsuit after evidence appeared that McKenzie was the one who ran the red light and was responsible for the incident. Shine was cautioned for driving without license, but not with any more serious charges. At his sentencing on June 1st, 2001, Barrow apologized to the shooting victims and said that he fired his gun in a panic. Shine, who stayed loyal to Puff Daddy, probably more than he should have, was sentenced to 10 years in prison with no eligibility for parole until 2009. Right now, I'm just, I just want to go and be with my kids, you know, and, and, and I'm just, I'm just, I'm just grateful. What about Shine, Mr. Combs? I'm just grateful. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, 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 sir. People probably have the impression that you're just consumed with the idea that, you know, justice wasn't served here and that somebody turned his back on you. It's not a matter of, you know, turning your back on me. Like, how do you call a witness to testify against your comrade? Shine began serving his sentence at Maximum Security Prison, Pinnacle Correctional Facility in Dannemora, New York. He cut all ties with Sean Combs and was released from his contract with Bad Boy Entertainment. His legal team tried to appeal for a suspended sentence, also known as probation, but ultimately failed and was denied. Well, at first, it seemed like his rap career was over before it started. Suddenly, record labels started calling up Shine in prison. Around 2004, many labels met with Shine while he was incarcerated and he ultimately signed a contract with Def Jam Records for $3 million. Not long after, on August 10, 2004, he released his second studio album called Godfather Burn Alive. The album included 13 tracks, 12 of which were previously recorded vocals before his incarceration, while one was recorded over the phone from jail. The song was called for the record and was a diss track in response to 50 Cent dissing Shine on Hot 97 during a freestyle. The album featured guest appearances from Corrupt, Nate Dogg and Foxy Brown. The album was also produced by Kanye West, Swiss Beats, Mike Dean and Jess Blaze. The album debuted at number 3 on the US Billboard 200 and sold 158,000 copies in its first week alone. The album also made Shine the second rapper after Tupac to have an album debut in the top 10 of the Billboard 200 while incarcerated. He even managed to conduct a few interviews before prison officials cracked down on him. If I'm telling you that she's lying and you saying, hey, you know, well, she helping me, but I'm facing 25 years. And you looking at probation. Yeah. Yeah, those are the things that you understand are unacceptable. You don't have to hold my hand. You don't have to do nothing, but don't, don't try to hurt me. This woman was the most damaging witness of any witness. Mm -hmm. She was worse than the prosecution's witness, right. which destroyed me because the prosecution is saying I'm this belligerent, reckless, you know, okay, corralled fella. Right. And then my co-defendant, is saying the same thing? That was it. That was it. Chen was also unavailable for any publicity contacts on Friday nights and Saturdays because he started to observe the Jewish Sabbath. Unfortunately, in May 2005, Shine's career was nevertheless stymied when a Brooklyn court froze profits on his latest album, citing a son of Sam Law that prevents criminals from making money from their crimes. A year later, he went to court to challenge New York's application of the law. He and his lawyers argued that by the court allowing Shine to make deals with record producers, it would enable him to pay higher potential settlement to victims of the nightclub shooting. I couldn't find any information if the motion was denied, but apart from his two mixtapes he released in 2004, both of which were compilations of of his most famous singles, there were no releases from him or his team up until his release. While in jail, he also got more in depth with the spiritual world and in March 2006, he legally changed his name to Moses Michael Levy Barrow. At the time of his arrest, he had already been studying Judaism for some time and he even went as far as saying that he identified as an Israelite since the age of 13 after learning that his great grandmother was a descendant of the Beta Israel, ancient Ethiopian Jews. His incarceration also drew many sympathizers as well as the admiration of many in the hip-hop community. His adherence to the Code of Silence, which he referred to several times on his debut album, earned him a hardcore reputation in the prison community and on the streets.
On July 21st, 2009, Shan was moved from Woodburn Correctional Facility in New York to Rikers Island in preparation for a parole hearing. On August 4th, 2009, a Manhattan judge signed an order that would schedule Shan for a release on October 6th, 2009. At the request of the New York State Department of Correctional Services, a mandatory probation of at least two and a half years was added to Shan's sentence since he only served 9 out of 10 years and was granted an early release. While Shan and his attorney had hoped to avoid probation, it was inevitable. On August 6, 2009, Shen was finally released from New York State custody. Unfortunately for Shen, his problems were yet again not over. As soon as he was released from prison, he was immediately taken into federal custody. Shen was detained by US Immigration and Customs Enforcement, also known as ICE. Federal officials were reviewing Shen's immigration status and deciding to whether or not he would be deported to his native Belize. You see, Shen had a permanent resident green card and his mother was a US citizen, but he had never become a naturalized citizen. There were also speculations during that time that Shan might be released on bail in the United States while his case was being resolved, but unfortunately, it didn't happen. According to his uncle, Michael Finnegan, who was a high-ranking Belizean politician, the family was prepared for rapper's potential return to Belize. He also revealed that Shan and his representatives had been expecting to be intercepted by ICE officials upon his release and had directed members of his legal team to prepare the necessary documents in an effort to address the situation. Belize's prime minister, Shan's father, Dean Barrow, sent a petition to New York Governor David Patterson, asking Patterson to pardon his son, similar to how he pardoned Slick Rick, who in a similar situation also faced deportation. According to Shine's father, he had been assured that the governor received his letter and that his request was under consideration, but that he did not expect to have any influence in swaying the decision. Apart from the family themselves doing everything in order to help Shine, they enlisted the assistance of Charles Ogletree, an attorney, Howard Law professor, and a part of President Barack Obama's circle in their attempt to forestall deportation and later to regain entry to the United States. In October 2009, his uncle stated that all legal matters regarding Shine's case had been turned over to Ogletree. Unfortunately, all of their efforts didn't change anything and Shine was ultimately deported back to Belize. Shine Jamal Barrow is back in Belize. He arrived at 2.40 this afternoon at the Philip Golson International Airport where he was met by family, fans and the media. On October 28, 2009, Shine was deported from the United States to Belize. Fortunately for him, Shine was now Belizean royalty. The previous year, Dean Barrow had become the country's prime minister and his brother had represented Mesop since 1993. Shine and his father patched up their relationship and soon he was appointed the Belize Music and Goodwill ambassador. He also signed a seven-figure deal with Def Jam Records in February 2010 and even announced that he was recording two LPs. The first one was said to be called Messiah and the second one called Gangland. Both albums according to Shine were scheduled to be released in December 2010. But before releasing anything new, he wanted to further his religious journey and in 2010, Shine moved to Jerusalem, Israel. He grew payout or side curls, wore a fedora and ray-bans and underwent an informal conversion. Shine has told that he spent up to 12 hours a day studying and learning Torah and underwent symbolic circumcision. My entire life screams that I have a Jewish soul. His music career, on the other hand, was more rockier than ever. While in Israel, Shan collaborated with Jewish-American reggae and rock musician Matisse Yehu on his single Messiah, which was released in April 2010. And later also released his first solo single, called Roller Song. Unfortunately, spending almost a decade in jail really screwed up his momentum. The song was not only a flop, but fans were criticizing Shine and his voice. It seemed like after such a long time in prison, his voice got even more raspier and deeper, which fans at the time didn't like at all. Shine, on the other hand, was blaming Def Jam. In October 2010, during an interview, Shine accused Def Jam CEO, Ellie Reid, for a lack of dedication towards hip hop artists. He said, I've been fixing to get up out of there for a while because Ellie Reid don't care about hip hop. The people up there, they don't know what they are doing. When you don't have a strong leader, where are you gonna go? He also expressed his feelings of leaving Def Jam and signing with Cash Money. I'm definitely trying to get with Cash Money. I'm not signed to Def Jam anyway. I might just have Cash Money do everything. Who knows? That's the beauty about being in the business for yourself. You can decide where you want to go and what you want to do. 
Although he blamed LAV for his fall, two weeks later, Shine issued an apology, stating, I was wrong about my assessment of Chairman Reed. After I stopped being emotional or things like that, I thought about the facts. The fact is that LA Reed was there when I was locked up, a few feet away from Death Row, in the Black Panthers. LA was on the visiting floor of Rikers Island, looking at me through the bars, showing me he believed in that gang by revolutionary music I make. Even though he retracted the statement, he was still trying to get a distribution deal with cash money. But unfortunately, one big obstacle in his way was his immigration status. This stopped Shine from signing with cash money. Berman didn't like the fact that he was not able to come to the United States and thought it would play a crucial role in his career. Soon, the year 2010 was over, but there was no sign of Shine or any of his LPs that he promised. At the beginning of 2011, Shine was once again blasted by Belizean fans, this time for a failed concert. You see, in March 2011, Shen came back to Belize and as an ambassador of music and for promotion for his now pushed album, Gangland, he decided to organize a concert. The concert was scheduled to be on March 25th, 2011, and it was supposed to feature local musicians, Jamaican artists, and also big names in hip-hop and R&B music. When asked about the upcoming concert, Shine said, It's going to be a night of your life. We got Black Rhino, Sino, all these Jamaican artists. It's going to be a nice event, really an experience. You're gonna get your money's worth. The concert tickets were $50. While they didn't disclose any names apart from Barrington Levy, who was supposed to perform one of Shine's hits, Bonnie and Shine, he kept hyping the public by telling people, we're looking forward to having an extraordinary night with extraordinary guests and even going as far as saying it's not so much a show for me as it is a dream come true. Belize fans were more excited than ever. It got to a point where only days before the event, they had to change the location of the concert from Princess Poolside to MCC Stadium to accommodate the large crowds. Soon, the rumors started to spread and people were expecting to see anything from Nelly, Busta Rhymes, Lil' Kim, Rick Ross, to Jay-Z and even Rihanna. However, Shine's dream quickly became a nightmare. Problems started to emerge when Barry Levington's flight to Belize from Miami was cancelled due to terrorist attack, which ultimately made him cancel his performance. Next came Shine's overhyped lineup filled with extraordinary guests. Not only none of them showed up, but later concert promoter DJ Richie said Shine was responsible for the international talent, but his part never come through. After no one other than Shine and a few local openers showed up, a disappointed crowd turned unruly and many demanded their $50 admission price back. The show was not only a disaster and massively overhyped, but people felt that they were robbed. Soon, people started to point fingers and put blame on everyone involved. DJ Richie claimed that he did his part. According to the contract, he was responsible for all the local artists that performed. Shine was responsible for two guest appearances, Barrington Levy and his own performance. Rich even went as far as saying that Shine was paid 50,000 Belize dollars or 25,000 US dollars for his performance. Shine did perform, he did this thing because we had a contract, but his part and his promises, I mean never did come through. And being ambassador, I think he owns Belize an apology or explained to us exactly what happened. I believed in him for so long, but I think now it's time for me to put my foot down and say yo, this the way it happened and have it plain black and white so nobody can tell me no fool. Shine claimed that DJ Richie was the one who never came through with the money he promised. Shine's management issued a statement saying, Throughout the entire process, DJ Richie conducted himself in a highly unprofessional manner. He failed to meet payment deadlines, crucial to the timely purchase of the airfare for Shine. Shine performed despite not being duly compensated as per his contract agreement. They never addressed why other artists never showed up, and due to the disappointed crowd and immediate backlash, Shine flew back to Israel the next morning. Regardless of who's at fault, this was not a good look for Shine. In August 2011, he appeared on the track Outro from Lil Wayne's album Carter 4, along with Bun B, Nas, Busta Rhymes. Poverty and desperation made me everything I be. And in December, he was once again speaking about signing to Cash Money Records, saying it's still a possibility. Ultimately, it didn't happen once again. In March 2012, he attended a fashion week in Paris, where he was photographed with Diddy, seemingly in good spirits. The same year, he finally released his mixtape, Gangland. While it didn't have any hit singles, it featured a lot of diss tracks. Shan is Diddy, Rick Ross, Drake, and 50 Cent. It also seemed like Shan was carrying a lot of grudges and was calling out everyone who stood in his way. In November 2012, he also became involved in a feud with the game. After Shan called Kendrick Lamar's album Good Kid Mad City, trash. Shen also dissed him on tracks such as Buried Judas, this name game on rhyme like while Gangland Mixtape was downloaded more than 100,000 times. In December 2012, Shine appeared on Complex Magazine list of rap stars who had suffered the worst fall-offs in rap history. Shine was ranked 23rd. His music career was going downhill fast, and while he gave his best to try and revive it, unfortunately, it was far too late. Much like Biggie's, Shine's career ended far too early.
The saying when one life ends, another begins, perfectly represents Shine's life. After so many failed attempts to get back into music, he decided to finally put it on pause. While he didn't formally announce his retirement, he was only featured on one song since 2012. The song is called Riding Round. He decided to shift his full focus to politics, since his father and a good amount of his family were involved in politics for all of their lives. Since he was appointed as the Belize Music and Goodwill Ambassador, he worked on promoting the country by bringing all sorts of celebrities like Kanye West, J Prince and Diddy to Belize and also work with its youth. Yo, I love Belize, I love Shine, I'm so happy to be here, we're gonna be back, love y'all. On October 2012, Shine publicly criticized former President Barack Obama for not doing anything to prevent the rapper's deportation to Belize and also endorsed Republican nominee Mitt Romney. Despite having a mutual friend, Professor Charles Ogletree, the man who was helping him during his deportation period, during an interview, he still said the following. He knows who I am. He knows what's happening. He always talking about he listens to hip hop. He knows who Shine is. The following year, he returned to Belize, where he married a businesswoman named Catherine, and a year later they had a daughter. Naomi. It wasn't until 2020 that his political career started to kick off. He was nominated by the center-right Belize United Democratic Party to stand as a candidate for the Belize House of Representatives in the 2020 Belizean general election. On November 11, 2020, Barrow won the House of Representatives seat for Mesopotamia. He succeeded his uncle, who was a representative for almost 30 years. Part of his platform is to strengthen Belizean governance, with increased penalties to those who commit crimes, to raise the salaries for its police, to strengthen the judicial system, to address crime, and for government to provide student loans at low interest rates. Shine subsequently was appointed the opposition leader in the House of Representatives and the leader of the Belize United Democratic Party. More good news followed because after more than 12 years being deported, he returned to the United States for a state visit in August 2021 to hold a meeting with US politicians. During the stay, the Atlanta City Council declared August 20th, 2021 Shine Barrow Day for his dedication, commitment, and service to the great people of Belize, Central America. As of today, Shine is continuing to represent and work on a better future for Belizean people. In 2025, he hopes to follow in his father's footsteps and become Belize's Prime Minister. Shine's love is a testament to the power of resilience and determination. He has overcome tremendous obstacles, both professionally and personally, and emerged on the other side as a respected artist and advocate for social justice. From his early days in New York to his rise in the music industry and his time in prison, Shine has demonstrated an unwavering commitment to his art and his values. The experiences that he endured during his life shaped Shine into a person that he is today, and he never failed to use his platform to amplify the voices of those who have been marginalized and oppressed. Pressed. His music and activism have inspired many, and his willingness to speak truth to power has made a significant impact on the world. All of us can draw inspiration from his resilience, his creativity, and his commitment to justice. Shine reminds all of us that even in the face of adversity, we have the power to rise above it and to find our voices and to make a difference in the world. Shine's legacy is a powerful reminder that with hard work and determination, anything is possible.